Let's take a look at problem 10-1A. We're talking equity and all sorts of new concepts here. Uh, get laid bare in this question. And the first concept we haven't discussed so far is the concept of preferred shares. When I was a little boy, I played a board game and the board game was called Stock Ticker. And you could, as an, it was, you pretended to be an investor. And as an investor, you could pretend to buy uh, preferred shares or common shares. And I, as a little kid, always wanted the preferred shares. And why was that? Because of branding the name preferred. I thought, well, I would prefer a preferred share. Wouldn't you prefer a preferred share? I always thought preferred shares were better. Now as an adult, I buy stock in companies. I do invest in, well, I buy mostly index funds, but I do buy stock in companies. And generally speaking, you want the common shares. And why is that? So what makes a preferred share preferred? Really two features that stand out. Different preferred shares can have different features, but the two ones that you see most frequently are one dividend preference so if the company pays a dividend and they want to pay dividends to all their shareholders they got to pay the preferred shareholders first so they're first in line for dividends and the second related to that is they often have a promised or a guaranteed dividend uh, uh, just built into the preferred share an expectation of regular dividends the final thing preference wise is if the company goes bankrupt which you're hoping it doesn't but if it goes bankrupt and all the creditors are lining up to get whatever money they can preferred shareholders get made whole before common shareholders preferred shareholders just get paid off in the case of a bankruptcy. Uh, but why would I prefer the common shares? Well, the common shareholders have access to the retained earnings. The, the retained earnings are thought of as belonging to the common shareholders. So when I buy stock in Microsoft or Apple, I'm looking for common shares, generally speaking. Okay, um, let's read on though. So this company has preferred shares, $10 non-cumulative. The $10 is the dividend. Non-cumulative means if they fail to pay it this year, they don't, it doesn't build up. Cumulative, maybe I'll explain it that way. If this was cumulative, $10 cumulative, they failed to pay the dividend this year, next year they got to pay 20. And the year after that, they got to pay 30. It's building up. This one is non-cumulative. Uh, it says 500 shares are issued, $50,000. You can do some quick math and go, oh, it's 100 bucks a share That's of the shares that are out there. No par is an interesting thing. We'll explore the concept of par value shares in problem 10-2. Uh, for, for now, just no par is like generally thought of as the way to go in the modern world or having a par value so small it might as well be no par we'll discuss par value though in problem 10 too I, I think no par uh is better than having par value but that's just me uh common shares a million authorized so we're allowed to issue up to a million but you know, we, we've only issued 20,000 shares and $200,000 worth of shares. So it's 10 bucks a share and you can see the retained earnings. Okay. A little bit of an intro there, but uh, the following equity transactions occurred and we're going to have to do journal entries. So uh, January 31st, we issued 5,000 common shares for $12 each. 5,000 times 12 is $60,000. And so what does that look like? Well, January 31st, we got cash. Now, when we issue shares for $12, the assumption here is they paid us in cash. So we're issuing shares. They're giving us cash, debit cash, credit, common shares. I want you to remember, and this is a common misconception, sometimes students think the credit to common shares is we are reducing an asset. We're giving up our shares, our shares are an asset, credit common shares because we're reducing an asset. No, no, no. This company has more shares now than it had before, which is a weird thing. The company had uh, 20,000 common shares before. After this, it has 25,000 common shares. Remember what common shares are, it's us keeping track of ownership stakes. And now we have more owners, right? Somebody just bought in $5,000, $12 each, $60,000 more got invested in our company. We have an owner that has a claim on $60,000 more of our assets, right? That's what this idea is. Uh, so, so credit in common shares makes our equity go up, not down. Uh, May 14th, 
issued preferred shares. Well, issuing preferred shares, just like issuing common shares, we issued 100 shares in exchange for equipment with a fair value of 10,500. Well, we got an asset, debit equipment, 10,500, and we credit preferred shares. And preferred shares, in terms of like journal entries, behave a lot like common shares. So it's just like, we issue the share for an asset, debit the asset, credit the, the share, in this case, a preferred share. Declared the regular cash dividend on the preferred shares. July 1st, Canada Day. Uh, okay, well, how many preferred shares are there? There were 500 and they were $10 shares. So 500 times 10 is 5,000, but wait, we issued a hundred more shares. So how many preferred shares do I have? I have 500 and then I just issued a hundred shares. I have 600 shares on which I'm paying a $10 dividend. That's $6,000 worth of dividends. What does this look like? I'm gonna debit preferred dividends. Some textbooks at this point debit retained earnings directly, because remember our dividends come out of retained earnings. Um, I don't do that, I, I debit a dividend account, but it's totally appropriate. If your textbook or your professor says debit retained earnings when we pay a dividend, that's great. Like that's how I would do it in practice. That's not how I teach it. Debit preferred dividends, we're gonna credit, normally we would credit cash, right? We pay a dividend, but it says declared the dividend. It doesn't say we paid it. And in fact, on July 15th, we paid it. So if I declare a dividend, it's saying, I'm promising to pay a dividend. I'm going through a formal declaration, a dividend is coming. And so because of that, I create a liability called, I'll call it preferred pref dividend dividends payable and the amount again six thousand dollars then on july the 15th we pay so july 15th credit cash six thousand dollars and the debit is to preferred dividends payable. I'll just read that one again because I feel like I read it in my head and I didn't read it out loud. Always with these problems, you can download them from my website linked below, but, uh, and you should be downloading. Uh, paid the regular cash dividend on the preferred share. So declared the regular dividend, that's July 1st, where we create a payable and then paying it. That's pretty straightforward, I think. Um, August the 7th, August the 7th. <laughs> Uh, what happens on August the 7th? We declared and issued a 5% stock dividend on the common shares at a time when the market price was $13 per share. Okay, a stock dividend is we pay our, our shareholders dividend, but we don't give them cash, we give them shares in our company. Um, and it's a funny transaction if you think about it, because when you pay a dividend, you reduce your retained earnings, like dividends get paid out of retained earnings. Just think of the statement of retained earnings, beginning retained earnings, plus net income, minus dividends. Dividends come out of your shareholder's equity. So our shareholder's equity goes up because we got a bunch of new shares, but it goes down by the exact same amount because we paid the, you know, it's a dividend, so it reduces our retained earnings. This company should look exactly the same the day before and the day after a stock dividend. So why do we do it if it doesn't change the company at all? And there's all sorts of academic papers around why does a stock dividend move a share price? Theoretically, it shouldn't do anything to the company, but it's, it's an interesting thing and it's more for a finance course but for us let's just look at the mechanics of it so we had when we entered this question 20,000 common shares outstanding and then we issued 5,000 common shares in our first transaction so we have 25,000 common shares and we're saying for every 100 shares you own we're going to give you five free ones we're just gonna issue you a dividend of five shares per hundred that you own, 5% stock dividend. So 25,000, we're gonna issue 5% new shares. That's 1,250 new shares, bringing us up to 26,250 in new shares. But we wanna issue 1,250 new shares at a time when the market price is $13 per share. So 1,250 times 13, 16,250 worth of shares, $16,000 worth of shares. You may look at this and go, well, wait, the share price, if I go 20,000 
200,000 divided by 20, these are like $10. And if I look at this, these ones were $12. And now we're looking at a $13 share price. What's with what's with this? Doesn't it need to be consistent? Doesn't it need to be the same? And the answer is no. The market price for shares goes up and down over time. Even for a private company, the market price changes, right? How much you could buy and sell your shares for. So there's nothing weird that the number was different every time. That's very normal. Okay, so we issued 16250 of new common shares. So credit common shares. 16250 and we debit dividends but in this case i'll call it common stock dividends because it's a not a con not just a normal dividend like not a common dividend it's a common stock dividend sort of a special dividend but again ultimately this is just to retained earnings this is just going to affect our retained earnings there we go we've done uh the first five now, the second part of the question, so we've, we've done the journal, if he's done part A. Part B says, assuming net income for the year is 125,000, prepare the December 31st, 2029 shareholders equity section. And this is the year before shareholders equity section we were given. And so it's just like update this for those transactions. That's what we've got to do. So let's do it. Let me grab that, pull that across. There we go, beautiful. Um, okay, so we'll start with our preferred shares. And I'm just gonna copy word for word what's in here, but just update anything that I know is out of date. So it's, I know it's still $10 non-cumulative. I didn't change my dividend policy. In fact, I lived up to it, right? We know we paid the dividends. 500 issued, no, it's more than 500 issued because on May 14th, we issued 100 more preferred shares. Then we paid a dividend that doesn't affect the number of shares. So it's 600 issues, 600 issued. And again, no par, we'll talk about par value in 10-2. Uh, so you have that to look forward to. Now it was $50,000, but it's gonna be more than that because I've added 10,500 to my preferred shares, right? I credited good preferred shares. They started at 50, they go up by 10,500, they're gonna be 60,500. That's my preferred shares. What about my commons? Still have a million authorized, and this authorized amount is just legally what I'm allowed to issue, the maximum amount of shares I can issue up to a million. Uh, now the reality is, if my company is wildly successful, I issue more shares, I can do it. I just need the shareholders to all agree to it. The idea is I can't issue more shares than I'm authorized and like screw somebody over essentially. <laughs> if you, uh, you know, issue so many new shares that you end up issuing so many that somebody who had voting power no longer has voting power or something. Uh, so this is a way to, to limit that. But the reality for most companies is it's just a non-issue, the amount of shares authorized. Um, 20,000 issued. Well, is it 20,000 issued? No, I issued more shares. I issued, let's see, I had 20,000. I issued five. Uh, that was the first common share transaction. And then I issued 1250 with my stock dividend. I'm at 26,250 issued now and yes these are no par and as i've said time and again we'll be looking at the concept of par in problem 10 too um what's the value of the common shares well let's check what we credited common shares for so the opening balance two hundred thousand. then i credit common shares for 60 so we're up to 260 then I credit common shares for 16 and that's it. No, no other credits to common shares. So 200 plus 60 is 260 plus 16, 276, 250, 276, 250. Okay, what about the retained earnings? Here you have to think of that old statement of retained earnings that we learned in chapter one. So remember how that works. I'm just gonna do a rough one here. Beginning retained earnings plus net income I'm going to subtotal minus dividends. And we got a few dividends. I'll leave a few lines here. Equals ending retained earnings. So our beginning retained earnings, 750. That was the end of last year. That's the beginning of this year. We're going to add net income. Net income was given 125. 
subtotals to 875. Then we take away our dividends. Now, what do we have for dividends? My computer froze. That's not good. It's going to unfreeze in three, two, one. Ah, there we go. Uh, I don't know what happens here. This is a fancy computer, but it freezes occasionally. Um, so we had two dividends. We had this preferred dividend here that we declared. And, and the day we declared, that's, that's a dividend as far as our accounting system is concerned. And we had the common stock dividend. Those both affect our retained earnings negatively. Those are our only two dividends. So $6,016,250. So minus 6,000, minus 16,250. In total, that's minus 22,250. Uh, Okay, so 875 minus the total of our dividends, 22,250, uh, 852,750. That's our ending retained earnings. That's what's going to go on the balance sheet. And, and we would do this. Like you would already know this number because you would have prepared your income statement. You prepare your statement of retained earnings and then you prepare your balance sheet. We're just having to sort of jump the step here. So 852. 750 let's total it up let's total our shareholders equity now there's no double check here it's not like oh i can see that my balance sheet is balanced therefore i did it right there's no magic number we're shooting for we're just trying to be careful trying to make sure we do it right plus 852750 and i end up on one one eight nine five hundred there it is my total shareholders equity so we've done a bunch of new equity transactions we've prepared a shareholders equity section with a little bit more detail than what we learned previously i hope this video helped and as always if these videos are helping you it really does help me to hit one of those buttons thanks for watching have a great day see you in the next video bye bye the next video in our series is right up here and if you want a supercut of all of the videos in this series that's the one down below.